We still be in the R months, so gather round me hearties while I tell you a thing about oyster pirates. Now there are two major instances of oyster piracy in U.S. history. On the west coast, we have the San Francisco Oyster Pirates. On the east coast, we have the Oyster Wars. Let's get ready to plunder! Oh, uh, sorry, flyover states. No Oyster Pirates for you. First, let's turn our eyes west to San Francisco, that jewel upon the bay. Now, all good pirate stories have the same root cause. Capitalism. In this case, the California Gold Rush of 1849. Specifically, the worst kind of trickle-down economics. I solemnly swear that I will not get distracted by the California gold rush in the making of this video. Okay, that should do it. Oh, shit. The California gold rush is a fundamental example of the true American spirit. It has everything. Genocide. Lawlessness. Ruthless violence against minorities. The myth of the American millionaire in bootstrapping. Ecological apocalypses. You name it, it's got it. In 1848, the population of San Francisco was barely a thousand people, and the non-native population of California was only 2,000. The discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in Coloma, California in 1848, however, ruined everything. By 1850, the non-native population in California had jumped to approximately 100,000, and in San Francisco alone, the population had jumped to 25,000. Which, if you think the housing crisis in San Francisco is bad today... Actually, I think the housing crisis in San Francisco is worse today. Anyway, it wasn't just the natural wealth of the mountains that was being exploited. Shellfish and other seafood were quickly harvested to meet the voracious demands of the growing boom towns. This, however, outstripped the supply of the native oyster beds in San Francisco Bay. Even as early as 1851, entrepreneurs had turned to exploiting oyster beds in other Pacific bays to feed this market, transporting live adult oysters from the Washington Territory and from Mexico. In 1865, Mark Twain even reported that imported Mexican oysters were far superior to the poor little insipid things we are accustomed to here. By 1869, the first Baltimore and New York adult oysters were shipped in on the newly completed Transcontinental Railroad. However, the appetites of Americans and other immigrants to this newly admitted state weren't the only threat to the poor native San Francisco oyster. After 1853, the California Gold Rush wasn't relying on your grandpa's ground sluicing anymore. No siree. More ground you move, the more gold you find. And nothing moves ground like hydraulic water cannons. Progress! It's super devastating. In fact, you can visit the Malakoff Diggin State Historic Park and see the scar of man's greed for yourself. That 7,000 foot long, 3,000 foot wide, and nearly 600 foot deep cannon Taint natural. Now the problem with moving about a billion cubic feet of topsoil and gravel is that it has to go somewhere. Stop me if you know this one, but water tends to go downstream and it likes to carry anything it can with it. Now you might see where I'm going with this. So from the Sierra Nevadas, that billion cubic feet of soil entered small mountain streams, which led to larger mountain streams, which led to piddling rivers, which led to larger rivers, which led to the Sacramento River, which led to the San Francisco Bay. According to the book Down by the Bay, 272 square miles of San Francisco Bay lost up to eight inches of depth. Side note, since the 19th century, about a third of the bay has been filled to make more land. The only problem is because these areas are landfill, they are considered prime earthquake liquefaction zones. Which, if you don't know what happens when an earthquake liquefies the ground underneath a city, uh, remind me to tell you a thing about Port Royal, Jamaica. Imagine you're a native oyster of San Francisco Bay. You're pretty much a filter with the mobility of a rock glued to other rocks. You're not going anywhere. And suddenly you find yourself covered and choked out by a whole lot of clay silt from the mountains. Your life has just been so hard since 1849. But don't worry, the humans are gonna ban hydraulic mining in 1888. You just have to survive till then. <sighs> so 
So let's talk about the floods of 1862. In 1861, the West Coast got absolutely punched by atmospheric rivers, the sort of once in a hundred year kind of weather event that strains all kinds of the ways nature can cope. Not only was water dumped on the entire West Coast, but abnormally warm weather caused the mountain snows to melt early. Taking into consideration you coated all of your rivers with clay silt and rocks which made it harder for the ground to absorb water, well, Long story short, Sacramento was underwater for three months, and so much fresh water flooded the bay, the estuary was like a freshwater river. According to Down by the Bay, the estuary became nearly entirely freshwater for as much as two weeks. Most species were probably wiped out in a stroke given their intolerance of fresh water and the duration of the flooding. The destructive effect of extremely low salinity could only have been magnified by the mud wave that paved the bay floor. One marine ecologist has speculated that the entire estuarine biota of San Francisco Bay may have been wiped out, reset, in those two weeks of flooding. Well, shit. Oysters and other shellfish, once plentiful, were hard if not impossible to find now in San Francisco Bay. Enter capitalism! State right. Gentlemen, gentlemen. So what if the native species of the bay have all been practically wiped out? Why, this is a golden opportunity for us. We'll just recreate the limitless abundance that I'm certain existed when we Americans arrived just, what, 20, 30 years ago? Why, we'll police the common man from over-harvesting, improve California's waterways by adding new species, reseeding the bay with the non-native varieties, and better yet, we'll make a fortune. The future, gentlemen, is fisheries. Yes, as if being colonized wasn't enough, federal, state, and local authorities did everything they could to make California waterways more productive according to their definition of what made a natural resource productive. Mainly, that it would become more exploitable. Enter the Atlantic oyster, stage left. So it turns out that the silt and pollution that was so bad for the native oyster was great for Atlantic ones. By the 1870s, those oyster entrepreneurs started shipping barrels full of oyster spat, or wee baby oysters, from the East Coast to San Francisco. Now the transplanted Atlantic oysters did just fine in the bay, except for one small, tiny problem. You see, there was just something about the bay's conditions that even though the Atlantic oysters were able to grow beautifully, they just couldn't produce any new spawn. The oyster companies were forced to ship fresh spat continuously to maintain the stock in their oysteries. On one hand, that makes the Atlantic oyster my favorite kind of invasive species. Without human intervention, they'd disappear on their own. On the other hand, that meant that the oyster companies had to put continual investment into their stock. And investments must always be protected. By the 1870s, conditions in the upper bays, like San Paolo Bay, were still too touchy for productive oyster beds due to the continued use of hydraulic water cannons in the mountains. The oystery companies began establishing their private oyster beds in the lower bay, on what were once common beds where water quality was more stable, further from the delta of the Sacramento River. By 1888, four oyster companies owned 600 acres of productive oyster beds in San Francisco Bay, and nobody could legally take oysters from land leased to these companies by the state. It was an oyster monopoly. When these industrial oyster beds were relocated to the South Bay, it might have been ecologically better for the transplanted oysters but it did put them in closer distance to communities that had traditionally relied on access to oyster beds. And thus, we have finally set the scene for the oyster pirates of San Francisco Bay. Working-class, integrated towns and neighborhoods like Oakland and Alameda relied on foraging and fishing for food and additional income. Jack London, Yes, that Jack London. Call of the Wild Jack London. Did I mention he was a socialist? Well, he was a socialist. And from Oakland. And he was tired of working long hours for low pay in a cannery. 
So he borrowed money from his foster mother, Virginia Prentice, bought a boat, and joined the gangs who raided the privately owned beds of Atlantic oysters planted along the eastern shoreline of San Francisco Bay. You see, the remnant oysters in the abandoned beds were indistinguishable from the protected, cultivated oysters. So oyster pirates like Jack London would pretend to tongue for oysters in the exhausted beds during the day, but then at night rush across the bay to the protected industrial beds and grab while the grabbing was good. Then they'd turn around and rush to the docks to sell their stolen goods before the commercial types could sell theirs. As long as they weren't caught in the act, there was no way to tell what oysters had been legally harvested and which had been pirated. How convenient. Yes, it was technically illegal, but to the local communities that were being denied access to what used to be public waterfront, the oyster pirates became folk heroes. Public opinion sanctioned the raiding of these private oyster beds, which came to symbolize the monopoly of common resources by privileged capitalists. Now, like all good pirate stories, it wasn't all drink up me hearties, yo ho. There were notoriously nasty people who worked as oyster pirates, and the work was dangerous. Eventually, Jack London's boat gave up the ghost, and he turned away from a life of piracy to join the California Fish Patrol. And then he turned around and made money writing about it. And then he got into eugenics. Talk about living long enough to see yourself become the villain, huh? By 1933, the San Francisco Bay was no longer a beneficial habitat for oysters, and the mighty oyster empire and the oyster pirates who exploited it were no more. So then what was the deal with the East Coast pirates? We're gonna need a longer video. To my Irlanders, Avi Finkel, Chandra, Johan Gossusen, Steve Harper, and William Christopher. Okay, I'm putting the pirate accent away now for a postcard! I got this postcard in the mail. Uh, it reads, this was a free stamped postcard. I enjoy your uh, frugalness there. So, uh, here we are. May this artsy photo of a farm truck inspire you in some way. It is a very artsy photo. Uh, also, Doom is the best movie ever, and the novelization makes it even better. XO, Chicago Peep. I actually really love the movie Doom, and it's not just because I love Carl Urban, although that's a huge part of why I love that movie. So you have obviously excellent taste. Thank you for the postcard. And if you would like to send me a postcard, uh, details in the uh, description of my video below. Like, subscribe, do all those fun things. Send me a postcard. Again, details below. If you would like to have your postcard read aloud on my show, I love postcards. Um, but on that note, uh, see you next time.